like five seconds from now. Am I ready now? It doesn't matter. <laughs> so it's every time I usually start a show just in the middle of a sentence anyway. So. <laughs> Uh, welcome everybody. Sorry we're a little late. Um, uh, welcome to Living Critically. Uh, today we have special like guest now, Chris no, Shelton, no, although no. I don't know. <laughs> you are now the first person to be on my channel three times. So oh. <laughs> yes. This is the second Living Critically you've done. The first one we did with God's Engineer, we talked about indoctrination. Uh, um, but you also came on with uh, Godless Cummer, Jeff, when we talked about Breaking Bad on TV time. So. Right, right, right. <laughs> oh, and then tonight we're going to talk about some ethics. Yes. <laughs> fun stuff tonight. Real fun stuff. But uh, right. yeah, thank you so much for just, sorry, we're a little late tonight. Um, uh, my normal producer is out of town. So the lovely and talented brain bug is stepping in to produce for me. So we really, really appreciate it. Um, but, and I also want to say really quick, happy birthday to Cadence, mm -hmm. a good friend of us in the channel. So happy birthday. Um, tonight, we are talking about something called Operation Paperclip. Um, if you don't know what that is, uh, you want to give a little tiny, you know, backstory of, uh, or just a synopsis of what it really was, Chris. Sure. Uh, so in uh, post-World War II, right at the end, uh, in fact, while the war was actually still going on, uh, after Germany had basically been defeated, there was the problem of what to do with a bunch of the Nazi German scientists, um, some of whom had pretty advanced knowledge of things that other countries wanted to get hold of, including Russia, Spain, other countries, right? There was a lot of interest in this. And so what ended up happening was um, these scientists were sort of dispersed around in different countries. Russia got a bunch of them uh, at gunpoint one night. 1946. And uh, starting 1945, we started accumulating, collecting these people up and using them or integrating them into our society in a way. And there's a lot, there's, you know, boatloads of details to all of this. It's not just simple thing of they went out and said, hey, you, 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 you get on the plane. It was a little more complicated than that. Yeah. The bottom line was about 1200 Nazi scientists ended up in the United States working here um, and, uh, those Nazi scientists had varying degrees of loyalty to the Nazi party. Some of them were there following orders. Some of them were quite willingly following orders and were there, you know, doing their part. And this is, went all the way up to, um, Warner, uh, Von Braun, head of the eventual head of NASA. Yeah. Um, and and this brought over his team of uh, who would worked on the V2 rocket, et cetera. So I'm probably going on too long, but that's the summary version of it. Um, yeah, in fact, Warner Von Braun not only became the head of NASA, there probably wouldn't have been an Apollo program without him. Um, so, and I would like to just start this discussion with a little disclaimer because well, I mean, everybody knows my background. I brought my plaque with me from working with NASA. I worked for the Challenger program. Um, but I don't want to think that there are any biases here because something that I haven't really discussed uh, much, I don't know if I've talked about it at all on this channel, but um, I, I'm first generation American and my father is from Holland and his parents, my grandparents actually met in a concentration camp. Um, even brought I, my grandfather made this you can't really see it but he carved this really cool uh walking stick when he, when he was there he was at Bochum in um in Germany taken like in, in 1943 I think when it, that's when the stick was made itself and they're both my my grandparents family is my my grandfather his brother survived and my grandmother had a couple cousins that survived other than that their entire families were wiped out I'm no fan of the Nazis in any way, just because I worked for NASA doesn't mean I'm gonna side either way. I just wanna put that out there. This is just a discussion about what happened and um, you know, ethics within science pretty much. So just wanted to have a little yes. disclaimer in, in that regard. Um, We're not yeah, so, with Nazis. Yeah. <laughs> 
I don't, I don't think anybody is really, well, no, I was going to say, I don't think anybody's really down with Nazis, but we do live in America right now where we have actual people that call themselves Nazis, so whatever the fuck. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting. Um, this, started, this started with, like you said, uh, uh, Russia came in, you know, both us and Russia were looking to get the best and the brightest. And, and what I think is interesting um, is the fact that we were sort of allies with Russia during World War II, even even while we were looking to to pick these these scientists and the best and the brightest out, while we were you know because they were the ones who helped end the war pretty much, um, but we were almost looking into the future at the fact that this was, I think a big problem a big issue was that Truman saw um, the Soviet Union as possibly taking Germany's space in terms of, of power and what they could do and the balance of power throughout the world. So that is one of the reasons that while we were, you know, allied with them against the Nazis, we immediately, you know, started to, to work against them and, and find the scientists that we needed to end up where we, we ended up in the Cold War. So. Right, exactly. And, and there were a number of, of problems facing us at that time. The more I've talked about this with some other people who know a lot about history from that time, the more I've, you know, really been like kind of sinking my teeth into this problem, the more complicated and and difficult it becomes, you know, because because you, you, you the, the tendency, I think, of course, would be Nazis bad. Anything yeah. to do with Nazis bad. Mm-hmm. Right. So the, the equation is very simple. Not too yeah. bad, right? So, and yet, uh, and, I, and and in no way, shape, or form am I singing any praises for Nazis as Nazis. Mm-hmm. Here you have this collection of human beings who have a knowledge set. They have and 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 brain power. They have intelligence. They have this this you know burning curiosity to learn about things like rockets and how they work. Mm-hmm. Or you know certain medical things that were all, that also were involved in this, or you know what makes uh, gas a good thing or or a bad thing, you know, and stuff like this. Um, you know, I, I read today that uh, Agent Orange came out of this, and Agent Orange was was meant to be this defoliant. It wasn't supposed to be hurting babies and killing people, but. You know, that's that's anyway, it's just kind of the fascination of the scientific process is what motivates some of these people more so than the ideology or the politics of what they're working on. You know, so the ethical questions are legion here. Yeah. And that, really yeah. And that's kind of what really got me fascinated about this whole topic was was the ethics of it. And the, and the fact that it's not necessarily real simple once you start breaking the problems of history apart around this particular incident, you know, this operation. Sorry, my dog. Um, so, <laughs> oh yeah, no, we have uh, a lot of these these scientists, um, you know, they started off working with the Nazi party, especially the scientists that worked with rocketry. Um, this was about weaponry when they were working for the Nazis. And even as they first came to America, um, the, one of the, the biggest ones that we know of, Werner von Braun, who ended up heading NASA, who we will talk about later on. We'll get to him, I swear. But he actually, when he was first brought over, was brought um, to an air base in New Mexico. And they were they used him before he started working for NASA, before NASA was even uh, brought to life, pretty much. He was working in terms of different types of rockets for weaponry itself in America. So you can, there are a lot of things that we see, um, even some of the, the, the biological and chemical weapons that, you know, the science itself, it, it's not evil. It's just about science. And that's where we, some of the ethical issues come into play because as scientists, how far do we push these bounds? And how far, you know, at what point do we say, well, yeah, this can, this can bring us to the moon, but it can also end life as we know it on this planet. It's something that Marie Curie had a real issue with because once um, after discovering radium and really, you know, it, it, she was very excited about radium to be, you know, she spent her entire life sleeping with a little vial of it in her bed 
because it glowed and it was cool and it was her thing, even though she ended up dying from it. But like, it, you know, when she first got into it, it was like, wow, there's so much that can be done. And, and you know, they ended up moving toward cancer treatments and all these different things that that could be done with the science. But then it started setting in on her. Well, but there are also really horrible things that can be done with my science. Like, what have I done? And she spent the rest of her life really worried about how it, how her science and how her discoveries would affect the rest of the world. And it really has, we wouldn't have had Hiroshima and Nagasaki without it. You know, there's just so much that can be gained from one science, whether it's bad or good, it depends on the scientist that, that takes on the study. Well, exactly. And how that science gets utilized because, you know, nuclear power, for example, is a, which was, you know, an outgrowth of the technology development from World War II, you know, Manhattan Project and all that was, um, you know, it's, it's something that as a technology has saved lives, has enabled many, many, many people to live much easier lives. I mean, electronic, you know, electric generation, um, nuclear power plants, power submarines, cow power, you know, some of our warships. I mean, you have, then they also power cities. I mean, so it's kind of like you go, okay, well, is the technology good or bad? I think, I think uh, a lot of the moral, con- you know, conversations I've seen on the internet recognize, people recognize pretty quickly that, you know, that a thing is in and of itself valueless. It's what's done with that thing that, that, mm-hmm. that matters. And, um, so I, yeah, I agree with that statement. I think the, the technology they were bringing over has been utilized for good and for evil. Yeah. You know? uh, there's actually a quote from, um, Von Braun and his defense of working under Hitler. And again, I will, we'll go over more about him after, but this I thought fit really well. He said, uh, the innate impartiality of scientific research, which in and of itself has no moral dimensions until its products are put to use by the larger society. Exactly. And yeah. one of the questions that I thought would be a, was an interesting point to look at in this whole affair is the scientists themselves. Because one thing I couldn't find in the research that I was doing, and I didn't read, you know, um, what's your name? Uh Angie uh, Jacobson. Jacobson. Yeah, I did not read her book. I mean, it's this huge book. I yeah. watched her interviews on, on Rogan and some other places. And she's the one, she's really the one who has done the deep, deep, deep dive on this and has written the definitive mm-hmm. book on it. But one thing I didn't see her address or get addressed in any other discussion about this is, did any of these scientists, and we're talking about over a thousand people plus their family members, so a total of about 5,000 people oh, total being brought over here. Did any of them ever at any time express any remorse? Were there any, was there any contrition? Was there any, oh my God, I can't believe what I was involved in, right? Seems to be a bit of a vacuum of information on that. We don't get down to the personal level when we start looking into, into this. And I think that's, a, I, I don't know, maybe it's covered in her book. I know she covers the specifics of, of a certain group of these scientists, but I'd be fascinated to see, did Von Braun or any of these people ever say, yeah, man, it was fucked up. You know, I was really, really wish I hadn't done that. Because I know the PR line used for the most part to kind of cover this up from the U.S. State Department's point of view was, no, we got the good Nazis. These were the guys. Yeah, that's what they kept. We got the good ones. Yeah. Well, the thing was, too, was you know? this wasn't information that was made public until the 1990s. Um, It wasn't until uh, there was another journalist before Annie Jacobson that had um, that had looked into this, kind of stumbled upon it and then used the Freedom of Information Act to get a bunch of records that had that nobody had ever seen prior to this. And said, oh, my God, uh, this actually happened. Like this wasn't something that was known. Um, In fact, broadly. No, you're right. Not broadly. known. Yeah. There was a of. Because I know um, Roosevelt was pushing back, Einstein was pushing back. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But yeah, I think you're right that it wasn't broadly understood what was happening. Well, what happened was, I mean, initially after these scientists were brought over, and these these were prisoners of war in a sense, because they were just like the, the both the Americans and the Soviets came in and said, "Hey, 
you work for us now, come with us. Although once in America, most of these scientists ended up, you know, it's not like they they sat in a prison cell or something like that. They they end up, you know, building families and lives and things like. But Truman um, had specifically said that um, he say he uh, forbade the agency from recruiting any Nazis or anybody that that supported the Nazi Party. Mm-hmm. However, it was the the. Uh, was the Office of Strategic Services is the the group that actually came in and brought them over, which was the precursor to the CIA at that point. They said, well, okay, so our our president says not to do this, but the thing is, here are all these really great scientists and most of them are Nazis. And so we're just going to like do what we can to cover up all of the bad shit that they did and their bad history. Mm -hmm. So during this time, while these were, you know, they were becoming Americans and working for America. They weren't even really allowed to say, oh, I was a Nazi and I fucked up. Like, even if they had decided that that it was the wrong thing to do, it, was some, it wasn't something that they could come out and publicly say, you know, this was wrong. I shouldn't have done this. They had to keep it quiet because of, you know, not only the fact that Operation Paperclip was kind of a secret, but because the OSS had worked so hard to whitewash their entire histories. They even went to Germany and scrubbed a lot of the, the their connections with the Nazi party and anything that they had to do with it. So that even in the future, if people looked into it, you know, they, they wouldn't be able to tell. Obviously that didn't work out so well, um, but they tried really hard to, to make sure that the rest of the world did not know that we had decided to take on a bunch of Nazis to, to exactly. work for us scientists. Exactly. And let's remember also that um, this took place over a matter of years. This was going on into the 1950s. Mm-hmm. This was not a one-time deal or a one-night shot where they loaded a bunch of people into a plane and then that was it. This yeah. was an ongoing thing that went on for years, finding, you know, tracking, finding out who these people were. And they, and it was interesting that they found out who they were because they found a German list that had been stashed in a bathroom of the scientists. Because Germany, at the end of the war, was trying to round these guys up because they had them out. Some of these guys were out doing a non-scientific work, and they were down to the end of the war, war effort trying to round these guys up and they had them and the Germans are quite efficient. So they had lists of these guys put together and that's how the Americans started figuring out who to find and round up uh, mm-hmm. after the war after this whole thing was going on. So um, it's just, it's such an interesting story, the way it all lays out. Um, and yeah, some of them were, you know, just they're on orders, just doing their thing. Some of them, I guess, were just, you know, scientists doing their science thing. A couple, <laughs> of, guys, um, a couple of guys, George Rickey, uh, no, not guilty of any crime, but he was returned to Germany in 1947 to stand trial. Uh, yep. Not acquitted because he was linked with something. And in 1951, weeks after his U.S. arrival, Walter Schreiber was linked by the Boston Globe to human experiments conducted by Kurt Blome, who yep. we were talking about before the show. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he emigrated to Argentina with the use of the uh, aid of the U.S. military. And then there was only one other guy, Arthur Rudolph, who in 84, under threat of prosecution relating to his connection to forced labor back in Germany, he renounced his U.S. citizenship and moved to Germany, and they granted his citizenship there. So, mm-hmm. not a lot of backlash or comp, or you know, or or consequences faced by these guys directly or individually that we know of, at least. Oh, you said, um, in, uh, talking about Kurt, Dr. Kurt Blom, he was actually uh, one of the ones that uh, developed the different uh, gases, and I think sarin was one of them. But he developed a bunch of uh, biological. Uh, agents. And in fact, he had been acquitted of his crimes, I think at Nuremberg. Um, And, uh, you know, something that we were talking about earlier, the the woman that wrote this uh, big book about the Operation Paperclip had met his son, who was horribly disgusted with what his father did, and had this big um, stack of papers from the trial that he had been acquitted at, 
and was and actually gave it to her because was like I can't I can't take this I don't I don't want this in my house I don't want him you know having to read through all of the horrible things that his father did but then also got away with partially because I'm sure uh, the U S fought for him uh, because he was working for them and one of the things. Um, about, uh, first of all, Operation Paperclip was, uh, started off as Operation Overcast, um, but then was changed to Opera. I don't know why they changed the name. They do that. Um, but the numbers on it are, are hard to, to reconcile because there are some, some sources that say it, it was only a couple of hundred. Some say it was thousands. It's really hard to tell how many, exactly how many of these scientists that were either Nazis or just worked for Nazi Germany themselves came over to America and became and began working for us. There's, we just don't have any idea what the actual numbers are. Well, it, I, yes, it's, it seems a little, I mean, they've got some idea, but it's, um, I mean, it's somewhere between, uh, you know, um, I've seen anything from 1,200 to 1,600 bin, people, men, yeah. and families. So, I mean, it's, we have a rough estimate. I mean, it's somewhere in there. But and also a lot of these major scientists brought over their own people as well. Like Dr. Blom himself I, um, yeah. had dozens of people under him that when he started working for the army, they were with him. And then they moved when he when NASA was formed, he went over and worked for NASA right away. And they moved with him as well. Right. So these, were people, he, these were hand-picked people that he brought over from the party that had worked for, worked with him on things like the V2 rocket, um, which by the way, the v, I did not know this, the V2 rocket, um, that name stands for Vengeance 2. Oh, I didn't know. So, yeah, that's a, so fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> well, obviously the first big, you know, question, the, the big broad question I think that comes to mind on this, uh, you know, at least again, morally or ethically looking at this from that perspective is, you know, does the end justify the means? Mm -hmm. And usually the answer to that question is a resounding hard no. Yeah. Um, but then again, you know, it's sort of like when you start talking about things in the real world versus the ivory tower academic sort of idea of things when you get into the into okay now we're talking real world here's these people what are we going to do with them they have this knowledge set that they they are somewhat dangerous individuals because of some of the knowledge they have they could end up becoming assets that would work for a company or a, a country that is opposed to us yeah right and this is you know, right, you know, we're talking about the war is still going on. It, there's no surety of what's going to happen in the future. We know Russia's our ally now, but we're already looking at it as a potential future enemy and resource mm -hmm. grabber for sure. There was a race for resources, and Russia was grabbing up as many as they could after World War, you know, while they were taking territory. And, uh, and we have this problem of what's the future going to hold. Plus, Japan had not surrendered yet. And we did not know what it was going to take to yeah. deal with Japan. So here are these assets, these resources, these people, human assets, human resources. What do you do with them? Take them out back and shoot them? Yeah. That's your alternative. You talk about how Japan hadn't surrendered yet. Um, one of the, the major scientists that, that America brought over was Dr. Heinz Schlick. Um, who was captured on a U-boat, fleeing um, over to Japan, hoping that, you know, they would take him in. Um, and he was, uh, he, it, not only when he, was he uh, taken in, but on the, the submarine that he was on, they had um, plans for the HS-293 glider bomb, the V-1 guide bomb, the V-2 rocket, um, which ended up becoming a Scud missile. Um, the ME-262 fighter aircraft, as well as 1,200 pounds of uranium oxide for atomic bombs. So he was on his way to Japan with all of this German information and resources, hoping that they would take him in and he would continue to do what he was doing and do so not in a great way if he was going to work for Japan. Um, yeah. But luckily, we found him. And, and, and perhaps he thought... I mean, 
not knowing about something like, you know, the existence of the then forming up idea of Operation Paperclip, right? Overcast becoming Paperclip. He probably had no idea. I mean, you could, I don't know, I can't tell from that where this guy stood ideologically. I mean, he could have just, yeah. well, if I go turn myself into the Americans, they're just going to take me out back and shoot me. So right. I better go to Japan. You know, at least they were allies and see what I can make happen. Or on the other hand, maybe he was a complete Nazi and he was like, I'm going to get to Japan and we're going to carry on the Third Reich from there. I mean, you know, yeah. you can't really tell with these guys. And um, but Jesus, man, what a what a mess. And and that's exactly the point is is when you're on the ground and something like that comes up, the first question any spy master is going to ask is, oh, shit, how many more of those guys are trying to get to Japan right now? Yeah. That we don't know about. And how we better find them and we better find them fast because if Japan gets hold of these guys, right, much less the future, t- you know, threat of uh, of Russia, you know, or, or these other, or some of these other countries. I don't know. I don't recall at that point. I think Italy was pretty out of the game at that point. But yeah, um, but yeah, man, like, whoa. You, you So it's, you know, I, I point these things out. I like, I like pointing this out only because I like to unsettle the simplicity of, of the situation. You know, mm-hmm. no, it's wrong. It's just wrong. It's just wrong. It's yeah. just wrong. It's just wrong. Well, I have an analogy, um, that I actually, when I think about it, I find uh, I find a little hypocrisy myself mm-hmm. because I think about, and, and this is a very simple comparison, but I think about Michael Jackson. I will not listen to Michael Jackson's music. Mm. Right? He was, I know, was never a huge fan, but I mean, obviously very talented artist and everything, but because of who he was, I won't listen to his music. On the flip side of that, uh, you know, Science is kind of more important. <laughs> so if you have a scientist that had an iffy backstory, but they, you know, made a discovery that helped millions of people, if they made a discovery that led to the Apollo program or whatever, and I just, I think in terms of you have the person and then you have the science, and I think the science is always going to outweigh whatever personal story is there. And I'm not saying, I'm saying there is still a gray area, obviously, um, you know, thing that pe- people's lives need to be cont- taken into consideration, especially if they work for someone like the Nazis. But at the same time, and again, like I said, I, I feel a bit hypocritical about this, the science for me, uh, because I'm a scientist myself, is always going to come first. And it is a a lot that came out of what these Nazi scientists put forth to the American people that that propelled us well beyond Russia, that gave us, it wasn't just, you know, it wasn't just about NASA. I mean, there were a lot of different sciences, a lot of disciplines that were covered. Um, our, you know, this program took every, as many scientists as they could, the best of the best. And at the time, Germany really did they were pushing the envelope on a lot of sciences. They were funding the same, you know, under, unfortunately to say under Hitler, especially starting in the mid thirties, he was really funding a lot of the sciences in order, if for nefarious reasons, of course, because he wanted to use them for warfare and for whatever he had planned down the road, but it's still the science at, at the very core of it, regardless of what's behind it and who was doing it. Well, so, exactly. He was, I mean, they were funding, you know, they 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 built up a war economy following, you know, post-World War One, right? In Versailles, mm-hmm. and the screw over that they got. So they went, okay, well, screw this. We're going to build back up. And they and they st- and they did so mainly by building up a war economy. And um, yeah, science was definitely a driver. And Germany's science was ahead of the rest of the world to a great degree in terms of jet technology, for example. They had jets up in the air at the end of the war. Uh, mm. While we were still flying propeller planes, and yeah. they, and that was a that was a problem, and we knew that was a problem. The only reason it wasn't more of a problem is because Hitler was more interested in. I, I just found this out earlier today talking to a friend. Uh, Hitler was more interested in um, jet bombers than he was in jet fighters. Yeah, and had he kind of you know at least according to my friend, had he put more into the fighters, we might have had a more bigger problem. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, Regardless of that, though, I'm I wanted to ask you about this because I think this is one of the ethical dilemmas that comes up here. And this has to do with the scientists themselves. I mentioned earlier, were any of them remorseful or were any of them, you know, contrite or whatever? But I wonder, does it even matter? Um, yeah. in the bigger scheme of things. And and is does science, as a specific category, should it morally get away with things that other classes or groups don't get away with? Yeah, that's, that's where, you know, like I said, I know I feel hypocritical about it because mm-hmm. it shouldn't. It really shouldn't. Um, but at the same time, you know, the... Uh, the rocketry itself, um, two, 300 years from now, when we are setting off to Mars and we can thank some of the work that Von Braun did, you know, is that really going to matter? Are we going to look back and say, okay, wait, 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 we cannot move on to another planet. We cannot, you know, say we have to escape Earth because of climate change and, and but no, we can't do it. We can't save our species because the basis for this science came from somebody who was a Nazi. Like, it's just not reasonable to think that way. Um, and and I feel, I, I, like I said, I feel hypocritical and I feel really bad about it. But to me, science is art that speaks for itself. Science already exists. You know, it, it is the scientists that discover things, um, but they're not really inventing all that much. They're putting their discoveries and their research into work to, to make things, yes. But it, it's it, it, like I said, it, I feel really hypocritical about it, but we, ha- we kind of have to look beyond, you know, what the individual scientists did. Now, however, if the science came out of like specifically for the reason of, I don't know, ending all humankind, maybe we should consider where it came from. But in terms, how, at what point do we draw the line? Because every person is flawed. So do we say, oh, this, you know, this scientist made a tweet one time that used a racial, racial, racial slur, words are hard. So are we going to scrap all their science? Like, Well, what, what line do we draw that? I, well, I'll tell you, according to a certain way of thinking these days, we would. And I, I also would tend to disagree with that. Um, I think knowledge acquired is knowledge that could be valuable in some context and should be kept or maintained. I guess then taking this to the extreme moral question that comes up around surrounding paperclip also is that it wasn't just individuals, but, you know, their research. And we had um, Nazi scientists in concentration camps, and we had Japanese scientists um, doing experiments, human experiments uh, of a similar nature. And I won't go into all the grim details of it because it's really disgusting. But um, you know, and in terms of water experiments, heat experiment, you know, really very unethically carried out experiments, things you would never get away with doing to people. No, uh, and they did them to prisoners of war and kept, and we found and kept that research, right? Because it's as 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 information as you know from the position you and I seem to be taking here. But I'm curious about this because when we take it all the way out to this level of people literally died so that we could have this information, mm-hmm. we didn't carry out the experiments. These guys did. We're not going to go carry out more of those experiments, but we're going to use this information. Yeah. Right. For some people, that's a, that's a very serious moral dilemma. What, I don't know what you think about that, taking it to that level. I mean, in terms of what would be the point of scrapping all of that? I mean, you have the knowledge there. It, like you said, it's not like we took it further and did the experiments themselves, but the data is there. Um, and to completely ignore it, what happens, you know, if uh, a couple generations down the line, people decide, hey, we want to know what happens when, you know, these experiments are, are brought out on humans and, and it's redone because they don't have the knowledge that it was done before. 
I mean, something um, to go a tiny bit off topic, but something that Annie Jacobson had mentioned and, and you had uh, asked me about when I was watched the, the Joe Rogan interview was um, the Area 51 stuff. Right. Now, the aliens that, you know, crashed were, were human beings that were altered by the Soviets. To made to look like aliens. Not the craziest story ever. <laughs> that's that's. I mean, that's what that. a middle finger from Stalin, right? Like that yeah. is actually something that you hear and you go, I never would have imagined that that was the case. But when you tell it to me like that, I can see the plausibility of it. It was like the the original and super troll, like really. Right? Like it's he's literally. Was where he knows they got secret I got a secret base and he goes all right I'm gonna go crash a ship there and I'm gonna put some aliens in it just to fuck mm-hmm. with you guys yep and just because I can right just to do that and who knows if we were doing that back I mean you know you don't know what kind of back and forth were the, the the details that have probably been lost over the years you know of of the back and forth who knows but the really fucked up thing is, that the Americans decided that they wanted to know how he did it. So they started taking handicapped children and experimenting on them. Yeah. To that- see how they altered human beings to, to look like, and, and what the fuck? Okay. That does not advance science at all. I mean, you're not talking about trying, you're talking about just physically changing a human being to look like something else. There's no advancement there whatsoever, but the Americans decided they were curious they wanted to know how they did it, so they took handicapped children and they experimented on them, and a lot of them died. And there's still actually we don't even know if they killed them afterwards or what happened, um, but to see how they did it. And so yeah, that when it has absolutely no real world application whatsoever it's clearly not going to advance our society at all it's just a matter of being and i understand that scientists are curious that's how we become scientists we want to learn the truth but that's that's pointless and that's just cruel and according to the nuremberg laws it is it is illegal to uh to experiment on human beings without their permission anyway so. Well, exactly. It's I, I, my issue is more of the unethicalness of the of the you know carry out of the study of the experiment. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, you know, you want to find out things about how to you know form and reform people's faces or whatever. Fine, but but how do you do that and not really mess people's lives up? You know, yeah. messing with you know handicapped kids. I mean, what the hell? I, and you know, and you, and unfortunately, you find things like that believable. Now, that is not, by the way, that whole story is not like a confirmed thing yeah. that we know that happened. We These are the, the the small snippets we're getting from different sources. Um, but I'm just saying, in terms of because you mentioned like keeping that data, and right. and after what they did, um, this what what is being what. Uh, they're claiming the Americans did with what happened at Area 51 is a step way farther, which makes looking back and, and seeing them just just keeping the research as kind of understandable. Because, you know, when you do have that data and you do know the research itself, it, it, how often is history going to repeat itself? Or say, well, we don't have to do this kind of shit. We don't need to experiment like they did because, look, they did it and here's what happened there's so the data exactly i mean yeah. and some of that information has been useful in terms of figuring out things for the space program and stuff for example you know stuff the nazis were doing um the data not you know again i'm not sitting here like condoning any of it, mm-hmm. it you know it's not it that's not the question the question isn't do you condone it yeah it was done it's a done deal whether i condone it or not they did it yeah now we have the results of it do you want it or not? Mm-hmm. You know, that's really the question. It's not a matter of, well, I'm going to use this data. And by using this data, I'm condoning the method of research by which it was gotten. Those are not two things that logically follow one another. So I, you know, so although I know people can, could make that argument, but I don't think it's a logical one. Well, I mean, we, we can look back at things like um, the Spanish Inquisition and see that the way that human beings were tortured during that time and know um, from 
the the writings of a lot of the priests and things how much a human being can withstand and you know we're not going to just ignore all of that and we're certainly not going to go back and do anything like that but that's still important things to know in terms of you know the science itself it, sure. Well, it's, it, I mean, it seems pretty clear, it, you know, data in and of itself, like I said, is, I, I think we agree that it's definitely not, um, in and of itself, it doesn't have a value. It's what you do with mm-hmm. it that gives it value. Yeah. Sci- yeah. The value. Science, it, science is rarely, if ever, evil on its own. It is what it is made to become, you know. Yeah, it's like um, what it. I mean, I, I look at it, for me, the analogy is kind of like our brain. You know, it's kind of like, um, it, it's capable of incredibly rational thinking. It's capable of generating emotions that feel quite amazing and are quite um, uplifting, uniting, compassionate, right? Empathetic. I mean, that this the, the brain is capable of creating those things and, and allowing us to interact that way. Yeah. The brain is also capable of creating Dachau. So yeah. <laughs> is the brain good or is the brain bad? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, the brain in and of itself isn't anything. It's what the person does with it and how we judge that contextually that decides the value of the thing. So yeah. that's my argument on it. I, I, I know it's it, it can seem a little cold to some people, but I think that's I, I think that's a fairly objective way of looking at it. And when it comes to the the scientists of Operation Paperclip, they actually invented a lot of things that that helped uh, Americans and mankind. Uh, there's synthetic rubber, the things that are used in tires, um, non-running hosiery, which you know, doesn't really matter, but it's something. Uh, the ear thermometer, electromagnetic tape, um, a lot of uh, uh, electric components, and were manufacturers. There's a lot of things that that came from borrowing, kidnapping these scientists that came to work for America, it, you know. So th- there is the argument that regardless of what they did and who they were, there they still a, a balance shift of well, they they did shitty things and were part of a shitty party, but look at all the advancements they made for mankind. What do you think about that? Well, and that's 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 the whole and justifies the means argument, and it's a difficult one in this case and in many cases because the the ends in this case the consequences of doing this, intended and unintended, are quite amazing. I mean, we have an internet because of this. We have GPS. We have satellites. We have cell phones. We have so much technology. Now the question, of course, is well. Would there's two questions I think that 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 tie into this in terms of the moral issue here, which is one, would we have invented those things or come up with those things without this happening? Yeah. And if so, how quickly would we have? Would it really have made this big of a difference? Mm-hmm. Um, I think is the first thing. And um, um and that then, I think, informs or allows us to see, well, okay, so did this end justify the means? Oh, the other question, of the other part about that is, while they were carrying this program out, they didn't know what the end of it was going to be. Yeah. We do. So it's really not a matter of, of looking at it from the position of should they have done it or shouldn't they have done it based on the information they had at the time. It's kind of stressing. We're looking at it from the position of having no the knowledge. We know a lot of good stuff came out of this. Uh, and a lot of uh, bad stuff came out of it. Too. Well, some bad stuff came out of it as well. Um, there were uh, there were some. The the CIA ended up using some of the science to conduct experiments on people. Um, one of which, under what was known as Operation Bluebird. Um, uh, there was a, a doctor, Frank Olson, that was given LSD against his will. Like he didn't know it was happening. He ended up leaping from a building, um, and that was uh, underneath the the umbrella of this whole Operation Paperclip thing. And that was that was actually when things started to come out about it. Mm. Because it you know something really horrible happened in the name of science, 
and it was connected to these these doctors that or these scientists that came over from Germany. Right. <laughs> There's it's always going to be a yin and yang to it. Exactly. Oh, I, I was wondering, actually, another thing that didn't particularly get covered in this, again, it's a very personal sort of detail, but, you know, there were also a lot of Jewish scientists, both in Germany prior to and during the war who got out before 42 when things went crazy. Um, and here, there were German scientists. We had, I mean, Oppenheimer, I believe, is, is Jewish. Um, sorry, Jewish scientists. We had Jewish scientists yeah. over here. Yeah. So when they import these Nazis over, like you have to imagine that there were probably some conflicts when some of these, you know, folks ran across each other years after the fact of this. Yeah. You know, I can't imagine that there were not some kinds of personal issues over the years with this. And, and this must have been part of the problem as well. I'm wondering if, you know, regardless of the fact that these uh, scientists clearly had, you know, were from Germany, they had German accents and whatnot, if they still weren't allowed to say, you know, well, actually, I worked for the Nazi party, you know. Oh, I'm sure they did. Or they weren't listening to that. This is a shore story. This is what they call it in Scientology is you give somebody a cover story, you tell them what to say or how to talk about it or something. I mean, unless you're really on close, personal, intimate you know, connection with somebody, one of these guys, I doubt they were just talking about their not yeah, openly but like, hey, yeah. want to see my old armband? Like, yeah. Exactly. Um, well, some of them have the scars. Oh, that's right. The scar, because one of the big things in the Nazi party was that they, when they were younger, um, they would duel a lot yeah. um, and they would cut the shit out of each other's faces. But when that would happen, they would uh, stuff horse hair into these scars to make them more pronounced so they would just look fucking nasty because they wanted to look like badasses in fact if you go back to the Nuremberg trials and you look at some of the pictures and it's all on the same it's, I think it's on the left side of their faces um because obviously the right slash yeah. but I mean, they're, almost all, they're, they're huge and they're hideous and this was you know done purposefully to make themselves look evil I mean, right. this happened it was it was oh, weird God. Russian tradition dueling and stuff. It was I mean that 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 evolved into the German high command and their this this really weird occult practices they had going on. I mean honestly, this isn't weird yeah. conspiracy stuff. They really were yeah. in the occult. Yeah, some weird shit going on at the top of the Nazi party. That is for sure. Um, um, yeah. So I wanted to since uh, you know my background is 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 nasa and and i think one of the, probably the most prominent figure of this operation paper clip, clip thing was warner von braun talk about him a little bit um the fact is there are only snippets that we really know about him um in terms of his time with the nazi party we know um annie jacobson had mentioned something about the fact that while he was working at a factory um, during the war, they actually used to take, or before the war, they would take um, the six slowest workers that were Jews and literally hang them outside of the factory to say, "Lay, look, don't be slow or we'll fucking kill you. And they were, they were Jews, so they didn't care. Um, there's just, there's conflicting reports as to his actual involvement. But um, prior to him coming to America, he was um, uh, he was kind of the head in terms of uh, liquid uh, fueled jet propulsion, um, as opposed to the solid rocket work, uh, fuel that worked with. I can't remember his boss at the time had um, worked with solid rocket fuel and saw his potential and brought him in and gave him funding to do this. Except under Hitler, they decided that there would um, the only rocket science at all in Germany would be headed under the military. So then he was, that's how he became part of Hitler's Nazi party because um, while he was working on the science, they said, well, actually, no, you can't do this anymore unless you're doing it directly for us. Right. So he worked, um, you know, and, and the, the liquid, liquid jet fuel propulsion was what kind of helped a lot in terms of uh, the Apollo program and everything like that in the future. Well, that was that was V2 stuff when he started working in Germany, right? Yeah. And um, that led to what would become 
rockets. He worked on the A the A four uh, and supersonic anti uh, supersonic jet uh, anti aircraft missiles, both wow. of which kind of combined into what became the uh, B two rocket. Right. Um, but so his work on that was what brought him into the party itself. And then when he was brought to America, like I said earlier, he was actually brought to White Sands in New Mexico to start working on um, bombs, pretty much. He was working on the jets to work with bombs, the, specifically atomic bombs and things like that. However, that all stopped, well, as far as we knew, as soon as NASA um, was, uh, as soon as they, they put together NASA, he, he was one of the first to, to go over there. They're like, oh, well, you actually would work really well in this program. So he stopped working for the military per se, and then started working for NASA and eventually ended up, um, like I said, his his science is what, uh, he helped develop the Saturn one, Saturn 1B, 1B and the Saturn V rockets. And if you know, the Saturn V rocket is what propelled um, the orbiter for, for the Apollo program. Right. And he rose in the ranks to end up running NASA. He did. I mean, he wasn't just a scientist at that point. He was the guy in charge. No, he was. He was, and not only that, but he in America became somewhat of a uh, somewhat of a celebrity mm -hmm. because he would he wrote a lot of like books that were very popular. He would he was on TV all the time talking about his work with NASA, and I mean. Uh, you know, especially with the great space race and stuff, it, this was big news back then. People were very interested in what was happening with the, the shuttle program. Yeah. Um, so he was, it, there, there are a lot of, you know, TV specials of him coming on and talking about what he does and a lot of interviews and things. He was well, well known. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you, if people at the time had, had known that, you know, just 10 years prior, 10, 20 years prior, he was working under Hitler, that really wouldn't have gone over all that well. Exactly. exactly. And that's the thing that hit me the hardest was I was like, wait a second, what? You know, I how there's a thing people do where they they think about the government economy, the budget, the government's budget, the government's budgeting, and they try to analogize it to a personal checkbook budget or a home, you know, home economy. And I think these two things are not really comparable. You know, well, if I can balance my budget, you know, the, the, the Congress should be able to. If I can balance my checkbook, then how come Congress can't, right? We, we get these kind of silly comparisons you heard this stuff right yeah yeah i i wonder if a similar argument couldn't be made for the kind of ethical decisions that get made at the level of state versus the level of the individual yeah you know what i mean like the the factors that are in play the considerations the reasons the the things you have to think about go so far beyond any one individual's moral issue mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That's what I started yeah. thinking about in relation to this question was like, I think it's a false equivalency when we evaluate yeah. what nation states do, what what governments do on an ethical scale when of, a, of an individual. We take an individual ethical scale and we go, well, the government, if I was, if the government was an individual, he shouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes nation states have to do that. Mm -hmm. I don't know. This is something I'm really puzzling about right now. I don't have any, I don't, I'm not. I think, I think it's, it's a matter of that when you're talking about encompassing a bunch of lives as opposed to just one, Yeah, it is just way too complicated to, to make that, that comparison, you know? I think so. It, I yeah. think it seems too simple. I mean, I think it's, it's kind of like, well, I wouldn't do that. Therefore, you know, the government shouldn't do it. And, we, and I think that a lot of political arguments I see, especially from younger people, tend to lack that nuance. And I don't, I'm don't. i not trying to paint with some big broad brush here and say everyone who's under 25 is an idiot. I'm not saying that at all. I've heard some very bright people say some very bright things. But I wonder sometimes about this, that our need to categorize and, and simplify 
oversimplifies when it comes to how we evaluate the decisions our government makes or governments in general make. Yeah. Yeah, you, you know you what I mean? Can't. You really can't. And it, it like I said, it's in in terms of it, an individual has a, a, a lot less to be, you know, in charge of and have to deal with than all of the things that an entire government has to. You just can't really make that comparison, can you? Because uh, because I look at this because I I think it really became clear to me when I started considering the question of this paperclip thing from the level of, okay, well here they are, here are these people, they exist, they're real, these scientists are there. It's 1946, it's 1945. There you are, you're the operative, or you're the guy in charge of this whole cleanup operation. And what are we going to do? And how are we going to move? you know, intelligence and, and science down the road, how are we gonna how are we gonna do this so that we don't have another Germany, we don't have Russia yeah. become another Germany, we take out Japan. You know, these are the problems you're trying to solve. And here are these scientists standing there and you go, well what am I supposed to do? Take them around back and shoot them? Yeah. Right. Because that knowledge set that somebody's gonna take advantage of that. Mm. You know, all these people have this skill set that they can do things other people can't do. And, and if I don't shoot them, then somebody's going to take advantage of that. Yeah. Guess it better be us. Exactly. It's just, you can't, it's hard to make that comparison. My friend, um, first of all, sorry if I've been missing stuff in the chats. I've been looking at my notes and talking and stuff. But from now on, if you have any questions, just tag me. Um, my friend Dave asked the question, what is better morally for society is not the same as, or it's not a question, I just made a statement, is not the same as um, that is moral for the individual. Yeah, exactly. I, I think I, the more I think about that, I used to, maybe that was just me, but I, I don't think I'm the only one who's got a thing about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've heard, no, yeah. very, I've heard, you know, one of the things that we do in the skeptic community or in the atheist community is debates. And one of the other things we do is we love making videos about ethics. <laughs> <laughs> I see the ethics um, debates and stuff, right? And I'm always like, okay, you know, what is ethics? What's good? What's bad? This kind of thing. But I, I wanted to talk about this with you because I thought, you know, no one, I don't see that often people taking a real world, real pol politic situation, and taking it out of the ivory tower and going, no, let's really talk about this. This this happened. Was it good? Was it bad? Or what was it exactly? Yeah. You know, and I don't what know. What was it? That's a very good, like, how? what was it overall? That's a very good question. Because it, yeah. it's not just about is it good or bad, but, you know, what kind of effect does it have? Not only the the... The science itself, which I mean, as we've discussed, the science is pure until what it's used. But what kind of effect does it have? The fact that we did this period, what what ethically does it mean that we were able to go back and bring, you know, horrible people involved with horrible people, if not themselves being Nazis, bring them and and making them part of our society in order to advance our science. What kind of ethical implications does that have? Do we, uh, in the future, do we excuse certain behaviors because we think we can get something out of it? Well, you know, country, my my ex friend likes to remind me all the time we don't have friends, we have interests. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not, we're not we're not friends with anybody. We're not. Friends. With Germany, or what? Sorry, with Germany, or with with Spain, or France. We're we're allies with them because we have common interests right now. Yeah, and and yeah. True potential, right? But not because we're all friends. It's a different. It's a whole different calculus. Mm -hmm. You know that you're doing at that level, and I, you know, I think there's a larger discussion here, maybe, of science in the 20th century and. You know, some of the bad science we saw or the bad experiments, the very ethically not cool experiments. I mean, we can talk about Tuskegee, Paperclip, uh, MK Ultra, which was like 120 different projects underneath the umbrella of MK Ultra. Mm -hmm. um, we're talking about very unethical experimentation done on, on human populations, on individuals, on army, on, on civilians. 
um, the, the, the Tuskegee thing where they were they studying syphilis on a collection on a group of, of, of black people who had contracted syphilis who didn't were not given or even made aware of the fact that, you know, hey, you should take some penicillin and cure your syphilis. And they kept going and they watched and, they, and watched as, you know, some of these folks died and stuff. I mean, it was just awful. So, yeah. so we also seem to have maybe, uh, maybe when it comes to the, the bad ethics part of this, or when we start looking at this more critically from the ethics standpoint, I think maybe this becomes one part of a bigger mosaic or picture of the 20th century and where science went in the 20th century. And maybe there's a conversation there as to the good and bad implications or, or decisions that were made with these mm-hmm with this level of, of inhuman experimentation, or, well, human experimentation taken to a very destructive level, you know, killing people and stuff. Yeah. You know, none of this should be rationalized or justified or made acceptable. This is a loss of human life. It shouldn't be okay. No. And yet here we are talking about it because the, you know, the, the consequences of, of paperclip were, you know, Probably, I mean, I think arguably a better society, but geez, yeah. at what cost, right? So I think there's a, I think maybe there's a broader conversation there too. Yeah, there really is. Do you think it helps or hurt the fact that it was ke- the the idea or this whole thing was kept secret for so long that people didn't actually know about it? What about well, what about it being secret? The Operation Paperclip itself, that Americans had no idea that, that for a very long time that this happened. Do you think that, that helped or that hurt? I think it, um, oh, man. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, jeez. I mean, had it had broader dissemination at the time it was happening, it probably could have and would have had a lot more resistance to it. I mean, Truman didn't have any problem. He said, sign, according to this quote in Wikipedia, he didn't have any problem with it. Um, I think that's because he was looking at the problem from the viewpoint of the president, not mm-hmm. an individual looking at every single moral decision these guys made. You know, yeah. he was looking at the, the some of the things we talk about, the broader picture, the bigger world picture, right? Um so I think on an individual ethics level, maybe, right, if we're sort of separating these things out, um, you have, um, you know, if you'd had more exposure, then I think it would have probably helped to stop that from happening. They would have come up with some other solution to the problem of what to do with these people, or they would have figured out some other way to make this happen, more likely, because um, they wanted what they wanted. and. Yeah. You know, and and at, again, at the beginning of the Cold War, that was knowledge, science, preparation, getting us on top. Mm-hmm. That was what was wanted. And, and anything else was a second priority to that. Yeah. Like um, you said earlier, they saw uh, Russia as a huge threat and they wanted to get ahead of it because they did not want they did not Russia want Russia to become Germany. And they right. knew that. You know, and something that Annie Jacobson says over and over again is that America always wants and needs to be. We have to be on top. We have to be because we see each We, you know, regardless of the horrible things we've done in the past and who we really are, we will always see our country as the the people that are morally on top and doing the right thing and looking for the best advancement. My issue here. There's kind of two sides to this. The fact that Operation Paperclip was kept hidden from the American public allowed for the science under these people to advance as it did. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, I'm sure there would have been a lot more pushback to it if people known right away that these were Nazi scientists coming over and working for our country. And they would have said, no, we don't want it. We don't want this. We have our own scientists, even though the public doesn't really couldn't truly fathom what that means. You have the best scientists in the world, let's use, utilize them. Um, but at the same time, it kind of screws us for the future as well, because we can't, we have to look at this ethically and, and say, there was an issue here. Can this sort of thing be done again? Can it be trusted? We need to be 
more upfront about where we are getting our science. Um, even though, like I said, you know, every every scientist is an asshole to some degree, as every person is. Everybody does something wrong in their lifetime, you know, and there and that's a hard line to draw. At what point do we say we're not going to take their science and we're not going to listen to them because they did this wrong? Right. But we just really need to understand that there are implications for lying and keeping this quiet in terms of any future advancement. So, I mean, I'm willing to bet if you got down to the details of the personal stories of some of these people, I mean, statistically speaking, it seems obvious that, you know, for some of them, at least, perhaps a majority, who knows? Mm -hmm. Um you know, there's a re- there's a moral redemption arc here, too, of coming out of Nazi Germany, having worked for the evil, the most evil core of people who've ever come around the pike, to coming over and enabling America and the space race and the discovery and the, and the, 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 the enlightenment and lift up of, of the human race as a species. I mean, all of us benefit from space travel from, you know, from the technology we were talking about. We've all benefited from that enormously, even third world countries that have no space program, no space technology of any kind, they still benefit on the ground from the technological advances of of the space race in their daily lives. So is there anyone who was, you know, so, so there's, there's, there's some real heavy arguments here for the the fact that maybe some of these people even redeem themselves in the process of this. But again, that's, that's a general sort of statement. I, you have to get into all the, de- you know, the details of these people's lives to, to find the truth of that. And that, that's actually one argument I hear against the whole space race thing is that like, why did we do this? What was the importance of it? But the thing was that beating the Soviet union out in, in the space race had implications beyond just space travel yeah you know they they had been beating us in fact um there there was an original program they were trying to um uh, america was trying to put a satellite into orbit and it got scrapped because of sputnik um russia came out with sputnik first they were the first to put a satellite in orbit and that's one of the things warner von braun was brought into into the explorer program um then in I think it was 1958, a year, a little less than a year after Sputnik, the first Sputnik came out, um, we had our first satellite put in orbit, which then, you know, brought about the Apollo program as well. But it wasn't just about us putting a man on the moon first. This was about putting Russia in its place. And as you said, there are even third world countries that benefited from this because there were implications to us beating Russia out in the space race that kept us on top politically as well as as a country of science as opposed to Russia. They got beat down and we were we kept on top just because it was about space doesn't mean it wasn't all encompassing. Exactly. (laughs) Well I mean if you go consider again in hindsight, I mean looking back on it with the with the with the benefit of having the knowledge we now have. If you look back at the space race and the consequences of it, the unintended consequences of it certainly could include, um, you know, capping the decade of the 60s um, with the landing on the moon, right? And what was it, June or July? July. Um, I mean, the 60s were probably the most tumultuous, awful, horrible set of circumstances for the United States. I mean, all the th- crap that went down Especially 69, Jesus. Well, yeah, you go all the way back to 63 with JFK, you know, Bay of Pigs, and, you know, 63 with JFK's assassination. But even prior to that, you have Bay of Pigs, you have threat of nuclear annihilation, a very real threat. We were minutes away from it. You had various accidents happening behind the scenes, too, that nobody, you know, knows too much about. But um, you have uh, MLK and the Civil Rights Movement. You have, uh, wasn't Kent State? Uh, with, oh, that was 70s. Was that 60s or 70s? I think that was 70s. I think that was 70s. Yeah. Um, oh, God. But all this this whole civil rights thing. And then uh, the, the second Kennedy assassination, MLK assassination. So the reason I'm laying all that out is because you have this wonderful victory 
of America winning mm-hmm. this race to the moon, you know, you can't discount the more the the morale boost. Yeah. Of something like that to the entire it really did bring this country together, regardless of class and race and all of that. You know, in July of 1969, very few Americans weren't just sitting there watching uh, the Apollo 8 or Apollo 11, sorry, um, you know, landing on the moon. It was what it brought this country together in exactly. like it was such a tumultuous time. There were there are way broader implications to this than just the fact that. Oh, we put a man on the moon because I've heard so many times. So fucking what? Right. Oh, right. It's way more complicated than so fucking what. And also, exactly. don't say that to me because I worked for them. So shut up. <laughs> but um, well, you know, I don't think people really understand the importance and value of Tang. <laughs> this is hilarious that you say this to me because I actually had this discussion the other day. Um, when I worked for NASA, it, nobody would talk about Tang because it was it was such a you know a, a, I'll say meme just to use the the word now, but at the it was 15 years ago, 17 years ago when I worked there, uh, it was like no, it's it's just funny that people bring Tang up and and I knew people that like would not even allow it in their offices because they're just like fuck Tang, shut up about Tang, but no, I know what you mean. <laughs> It's here. Exactly. So, obviously, you know, joking there, but, um, you know, the when you really kind of, you know, really look at the big, big picture here and you take out all the the Venn diagrams of all the consequences and, and uh, you know, and, and co- sort of the concentric circle, the ripple effects, that's the word I'm looking for. When you look yeah. at the ripple effects of this, you see they go out very, very far. And I don't know that there's very many people on the, in the, on the, the world today who aren't touched in some way by the events of post-World War II, including Operation Paperclip. It was a very, very formative thing for us in the middle of the 20th century there. So I just, I, I don't know. I think that, I think these, these things are complicated. I think they're fascinating. And I think that they, um, when you look at them at that level, I think they resist simple moral equations Mm -hmm. yeah they really do um in terms of von braun i mean he spent the rest of his life gaining his own sort of notoriety he uh even he became a a u.s citizen in 1955 he did he did end up heading nasa after carrying a whole lot of the the apollo program in fact he uh, under him um he also helped develop uh, missiles for the for the U.S. Army as well before he started working for NASA. The the missiles he that were developed under his leadership were the Redstone, the Jupiter C, the Juno, and the Pershing, just to name a few. Um, and then moving over to NASA, but it, that was where his heart really lay was in space exploration. Because um, after he left NASA, he founded the National Space Institute, which was um, it was a private institute where they just kind of pushed the public understanding of, of space exploration. It was about education to him. So, uh, you know, regardless of who he was, when he worked under Hitler, he did end up doing really great things. Not only, I mean, it wasn't just, you know, you work for us and he did it. Once he even retired, he still went on to spread knowledge and you know make sure that the American public knew the the positive implications of what space exploration had to offer. And that's just one scientist out of the 12 to 1600 that that came over. So we don't know, you know, how much of a positive impact each and every single one of them had. We don't know, like you said, their personal story, whether or not they it, see for me, okay. Science. People that, are, that become scientists, you know, I mean, we all have our political ideologies and, and leanings and whatnot, but when it comes to science, we care about the pure science itself, at least most of the scientists that I know. You know, regardless of what's going on around us, you put a, you put a problem or a question in front of our faces and we want to solve it just for the sake of pure science. And I think that's why, in terms of asking the question, well, 
Is there a difference between had they brought philosophers over or any other kind of, of you know, industry as opposed to these are specifically scientists that they brought over that worked just mainly on the science itself. And it's about the pure science. Yeah. That's why I feel as horrible as the whole situation is. And I feel terrible about the fact that uh, America was left in the dark about it. But I know about all the advancements that came not only for NASA itself, but in, in many disciplines of science. Because yeah. the best of the best were German and they were brought here. So. Yeah. It's a tough one, man. I find few questions as morally difficult as this one mm -hmm. in, in back at some points in history. I'm sure there are many, many others, but I'm just saying for me, this one comes up real fast as a, a you know, way more than, um, say, MK Ultra. Yeah. I mean, what did we get out of that? You know, I mean, probably a lot, uh, but compared to you know, the, 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 what we've gotten technologically and, and the advancements we've made medically as well from, you know, from the, from what happened here, I, I don't think it's any comparison at all, you know, and MK ultra is another example of gross and glaring, blatant human rights atrocities and violations in the name of forwarding, you know, national understanding of coercion, mind control, et cetera. And uh, mm -hmm. these are real things and they should be known about, but the way they went about it was pretty awful. And, uh, and I don't know that that's as easily justifiable as you know, easily justifiable. I don't think this is very easily justifiable either, but at least this, to me, this seems more so in the category of I'm able to rationalize the, this, this given the, you know, the, the results of it versus, MK Ultra, or a bunch of the other stuff that the government's been involved in that was just pure, unadulterated nonsense. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Do you think that uh, we came to any actual conclusions here today, or did we just, you know? Well, I, I feel not necessarily like concluded, but I do feel like I got a chance to talk about some of my thoughts about this out loud and sort of wonder about it with you. And that was nice. Yeah. Like I said, I didn't come into this on a platform of, well, here's how it is, and this is the yeah. position, and I'm gonna argue this till I, you know, it's the hill I'm gonna die on. I, <laughs> you know, I, I'm talking about it. I, you know, for me, this is food for thought. You know, I wanna yeah. I wanna stimulate people's critical thinking and and so they can um throw it back at me, you know, give me mm -hmm. ideas I haven't thought of or something, you know, on this. Yeah, this is one of those questions that I think. I'm not sure you can really have a concrete answer on unless you are, you, you know, maybe a Nazi supporter and just decide it doesn't matter. So, but most people know what happened under Hitler was wrong, but also know that scientific advancement is a good thing. So it, it, I think it's hard for everybody to kind of decide where they lie on this argument because in terms of morality, and ethics in science, it, it, it there's such a huge fucking gray area. There really is. Exactly. It's so. tough. It's tough. It's tough how you look at it. It's tough how you, uh, what level you look at it. I mean, I think that's, I think that's where this kind of, kind of comes up is, is you look at, you know, you realize that there are, that, that these conversations are not, are not just a single level or a single layer and that's all there is to it. And it's, it's so simple. It's so easy. What's the problem? It's a, it's not like that with questions like this one. And I can tell you this though, when I worked for NASA, I feel, you know, prior to, you know, when you brought the subject to my attention, um, I knew about it, but it wasn't something I, I knew that it was something that NASA wasn't proud of. Mm -hmm. Because while, you know, I, I've been to Kennedy and, and actually seen pictures of Von Braun up in, in like the lobby and things like that. It, it wasn't something that was we didn't talk about him a lot. We didn't talk about we certainly, you know, if you brought up Operation Paperclip, it was kind of like, nah, like, we fucked up. Like, it's it's possible that we fucked up. Let's let's not talk about it. Like, it was something that I think the agency knows that is a dark spot in their past and would like to move move forward from. Um, but we still wouldn't have had the Apollo program. We wouldn't, we wouldn't have NASA as it is now 
uh, or the Apollo, we wouldn't have had the Apollo program. There's so much that we wouldn't have had this not happened. So as horrible as the whole encompassing situation is, we know that we gained something from it and are slightly embarrassed about that and don't really want to admit to it and therefore won't really talk about it. Exactly. So. And I think that's actually the reason why it doesn't get talked about a lot, gets bounced around, gets ignored. Is I think it's painful for people to mm -hmm. really consider this at a deep, you know, in a deep way because it's because it is so goddamn complicated and difficult, and you realize that it's not a simple Simon equation. No, because if you end up coming on the side of oh no, Operation Paperclip was absolutely brilliant, we wouldn't, you know. We would be totally screwed without it. You kind of look like an asshole. So yeah. you, just, you, you have to kind of walk this very narrow line here to, to come out at least. Uh, there's just so much to understand and, and so much to, to go over in terms of the ethics, but you, you never really have a, a solid ground and, and to be able to say one way or the other, because just in most of life, it, it's just way more complicated than a black and white answer. Exactly. So, well, I'm glad we got a chance to talk about it, though. Me too. And uh, thank you so much for, you know, asking me to do this and coming on my channel to do it. And uh, you know how much I love having you on. You're a great friend. Um, and, I, uh, you know, you're welcome back anytime, Chris. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Do you uh, have anything coming up that you want to show for yourself? Well, I will. I will pimp um, the vampire podcast I just did that I posted yesterday. Uh, it's all about vampires and myth and legend, which is something I never talk about. <laughs> totally new concept, totally new idea to talk about that. I just happened to have the opportunity come up. So that was fun. Uh, so you can find that on my channel. Otherwise, um, you know, I've done some really, we have this nice call-in show we do on Wednesdays, and that's live, and that'll be this coming up Wednesday, and uh, and otherwise, um, just a bunch of content uh, I'm putting together to come out in the future. Most, I think, are the probably the next big thing I'll have come out will be on uh, multi-level marketing, MLMs as cults, because yeah. they are little cults, and uh, yeah. there's a lot yeah. to talk about there, so that's that's what I'm working on now. Um, if you, I put Chris's links in the description, if anybody watching this doesn't know who he is, but for fuck's sake, how can you not? Um, uh, I do, I think the next, uh, I do want to go over your book with you. Uh, we just hadn't gotten a chance to yet because I, you know, got sick and everything, but I would love to be able to do that. Um, if anybody who doesn't know, Chris is an ex-scientologist. Um, and he wrote a book on it, uh, but he goes into a lot. If you go check out his channel, it's all about just like me thinking critically and being able to wade through these, you know, ethical decisions and stuff like that in the correct way. And he talks about cults a lot. He talks about Scientology, all sorts of things. He's just amazing. <laughs> Your channel's amazing. So please, if you're not subbed to him, go do that. Check him out. Uh, and you're welcome back anytime. So, I would also like to thank Brainbug, who produced for me tonight. Um, my normal producer uh, is out of town. So, thank you, Brainbug. I know we were a little late getting started, but I really appreciate it. Fantastic job. So, thank you. And uh, I have no fucking clue what I'm doing next week at this time. So, no shilling for me. But uh, I will be back <laughs> next Sunday with something. So, we will see you next week. And uh, thank you so much, Chris. As always, and just remember, everybody, think critically. See you later. Bye-bye.